Trust is at an all-time low. People don't trust sellers and marketers. They trust their friends. What we try to do is match the way we market to the way modern humans behave and shop and buy. With inbound marketing, we had a very strong point of view. It wasn't about the product, it wasn't about the software, it was about this entire movement. This is not a fad, this is the future. HubSpot's product organization is on fire these days. Crafting a CRM product in-house with love from the ground up. The best time to work on culture is time T equals zero. Trying to build a company that our kids would be proud of. I have a great co-founder and a great team. We laugh a ton. So much work left to be done. Feels like we're in early innings. Our mission is we want to enable millions of companies to grow better. There's so much more work to do. All right. How's everybody doing? Having fun? Have we heard enough about venture capital? Is it time to talk about building a business again today? All right. Ooh, nice crowd. Um, well, thanks. We have a treat. Um, we have um, not only two of my favorite founders, we have them together, um, and we have a product. How many of you guys use HubSpot? Raise a show of hands. Ooh, that, that's pretty you. good, right? Thank, thank you. you, thank you, thank yeah. you. How many of you like truly rely on HubSpot as like the core of your business? Yeah, so pretty cool, pretty cool. So um, a lot has changed at HubSpot over the years. I want to, I want to talk about it, but I wanted to, to, since this is sort of our 10th anniversary, this is a little niche, but this was our very first blog post on the left. And before anyone went public, this was 2012, a long yeah. time ago, right? In SaaS? A long time ago. And Inc. used to publish everyone's well, we revenues, we went, remember? We went public in 2012? No, no, this was before you went public. Okay. And yeah, everyone would lie, everyone would say, you know, we're doing so great. <laughs> and, I, and I wrote up all the, all the ones that were there, and, and a lot of the top ones actually <laughs> declined and didn't make it, and there was HubSpot. So this is probably wrong, but back then it said 28.5 in gap revenue. Now that might be wrong and it's disclosed, but that's 10 years ago for Saster. And then fast forward today, we're at $1.7 billion run rate last quarter. Yep. Close enough for, for founders. I mean, that's, that is the power of compounding revenue, isn't it? I mean, that is, yep. that's crazy to think what 10 years of hard work does, right? It's epic, isn't it? And um, we'll talk more about it. And actually, HubSpot has accelerated after a billion in revenue, which is pretty, if you think about where we were, it's pretty crazy. So it's fun for me. I actually knew less about HubSpot than I should have back then, but I... I called it out as someone that was clearly gonna gonna break out, but I knew the website grader and yep. like all that stuff. I just didn't know how it all how it all fit together in my head. So it's it's just been fun that HubSpot a little bit has been part of the journey since since our first first blog post. Um, so uh, I think we need here. I wanna I wanna spend maybe uh, ten or fifteen percent of our time talking about co-founder stuff. It's pretty mm -hmm. rare to get co-founders. You're still together. You haven't gotten divorced or broken up yet, right? Um, and then I want to dig into some really interesting things that have changed at HubSpot that I think help you. And then uh, we'll have a little bit of time. We'll at least do three or four questions. So, so hold, hold a few. Um, but on this one, just uh, this journey accelerating after a billion. But to each of you, what's one of these phase changes that's just so visceral to you? Like, what's, what's an interesting story or what was the most visceral change that we can see on this journey? Maybe I can... One is just shifting from being a kind of marketing apps company and going from product n equals one to product kind of n equals two. Yep. Um, that's a dimensional change in complexity of the business. Everything yeah. gets kind of uh, not linearly harder, but exponentially harder. Um, so that was a big shift. So. I would just say like our mindset from the beginning is, well, this is guy Peter Thiel. Yes, yeah. smart. Yeah, I don't, like his, I don't smart. like his politics, yeah. but he has a really smart thing he said in his book. He says you have to be right about something that everyone thinks you're wrong about for a long period of time. And we kind of take that to heart, and we've always sort of, if everyone's zigging, we'll zag. Yeah. So in the early days of HubSpot, everyone wanted us to go to the enterprise. We're saying, no, 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 we're going to SMB, and we have a long story about why we did that. And then six, seven years later, we said we're going to want to move from a marketing app to a CRM suite. Everyone said, Big blues in the way, you're never gonna pull it off. They're unassailable. We're like, we can do it, we know we can do it. So we sort of, again, Zach and everyone's like, these days, everyone's like, oh, you wanna build a big CRM company? The playbook's very simple. You just start acquiring businesses and you cobble together this mess of the CRM, Oracle, et cetera. Lots of companies have done that. We don't have to name names. And we said, no, we're gonna craft together this beautiful application and build it in house, kind of like the way Apple would do it. So I think one thing that's worked for us along the way is we've had a healthy, 
disrespect for conventional wisdom. Was, now HubSpot could mean a lot of things. Actually, I don't know what it means. Was this always the vision to be some sort of SMB business week? What was this initial vision on, I actually don't know, on day zero? Yeah, the only reason, well, not the, I mean, the primary reason we started the company is both of us had a uh, passion for SMB. This is when we were both grad school students when we yep. first kind of met, met as classmates. And partly the reason is uh, we had both done enterprise software before in our prior lives. As it turns out, enterprise software sucks as a life. Um, you've got these extended sales cycles. It takes you so long to figure out product market fit because you don't get as many data points back. Um, the other end of the spectrum, you could do consumer applications, consumer companies, and those tend to be very kind of uh, bimodal outcomes. Either you could come up with something great as the next Facebook and it's billion plus dollars, and, or it's nothing because you, you know, the advertising subsidized business, you just don't know if you're going to break it through. The beauty of SMB is that you have the kind of old-fashionedness of enterprise, which is you can charge money for software, but you have the scale of consumer where there's millions of them out there to be served. Yeah. And we were just excited about, and we thought it was an underserved market, that you know, there were, everybody ends up getting pulled up into the enterprise, uh, and, and we felt that if we could kind of have the courage of our conviction and stay in SMB, that that would, be, that would work itself out. That was the, one of the founding theses of uh, HubSpot. Yeah. We had a slide, we had a really good slide in our deck. This is a New Yorker cartoon and there's a dog typing on the internet, and there's a dog looking over his shoulder very carefully, and the dog typing on the internet says, you know, the great thing about the internet is nobody knows you're a dog. And <laughs> I love that slide, and it's kind of true. Like, you can't tell how big a company is on the internet uh, yeah. through their website and whatnot. And so we thought the internet disproportionately benefited small businesses, startups, relative to large businesses and scale-ups. And that was, our, that was our thesis. And everybody thought we were wrong. It was. The, the hardest chapters in HubSpot were raising all our funding rounds because nobody, everybody wanted us to go to the enterprise. Yeah, By the way, and when we were thought wrong for a very long time, every board meeting, every like, it's like, okay, so we get it that you're starting in SMB, but surely you have a path to the enterprise. I'm like, no, we, we we're doing SMB. Year goes by, five years go by, ten years go by. We're on the IPO roads, but but you must have a path. To the, I'm like, I know it's, but. Where's the, like, no, we're not. I hate when they call you Shirley like that. I know, yeah. yeah. <laughs> do you think, um, <laughs> nicely played, Brian. And I do want to talk about what the I'm vision was on day zero versus today, but this, the, the more I thought about this SMB stuff, and I had, some, I, had, I had some of that DNA too, but I changed my mind quickly to, to survive. Sure. Um, but do you think it's just, it really is people's DNA? Um, that that it's, it's that passion? Is that what kept, kept? I mean, we'll talk in a minute about, as you said in a tweet, as HubSpot at a, you know, at a low five-figure price point, it's really an, a, a, a bigger SMB or an M of the yeah, SMB. We're really but, the M and SMB. But when the board was pushing you back in the day, um, was it more cultural? Was it more just we don't want to do it as human beings because we don't have passion? I think two things. We did, th we did think that the internet disproportionately benefited small relative to large, particularly on the marketing side. Yes. We also saw the business model evolving where you can actually scale a small business uh, um, software company. You, you, there are two tricks to it. You need to keep your CAC low, which is a hard thing to do, and you can't do that with, the, with like major advertising budgets. Um, yeah, you need some sort of viral marketing, freemium motion, product-led growth. You need to really get good at keeping CAC low. And then you're going to churn out customers. So your yep. customer... You know, your customer dollar retention, you're going to have a divot to fill, and you need a second product or a second access to your pricing so your best customers can fill that divot and you grow through it. And the metrics on HubSpot, like if you look at HubSpot back uh, maybe in 2012 when you wrote that article, like our customer dollar retention was probably 70%, mm -hmm. and our upsell was maybe five, so we were 75% um, uh, total. And now that 70 has gone to plus or minus 90%. And so the customers are much happier, they're staying around longer or whatnot. And then the upsell is more like 20%, and so it's 110. And so over time, our business model got much stronger our, 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 and our product got much stronger and really helped us scale. Yeah, I didn't, I did hit that later, but I didn't, it's interesting. So if when we wrote this, you were in 20, 30 million something revenue, you still had crummy SMB numbers. What, what, today we would call them shitty SMB numbers. Shitty. Yes. No, no VC, no matter how, that just, just made 5 billion on Figma would fund an SMB company at 25 million ARR with 75%. Yet we know why it is. Like yep. the smallest do churn every month. They go out of business, they change, yep. and upsells hard. How did you? What's your advice on that? Because it, I, I, I'm, I, I challenge folks to at least have a path to 100. It's like a path to profitability. Like you also, I think, almost need a path to 100 so that you don't plateau. When the, the mechanics are not hard. It's exactly the component pieces. You have to. Uh, make the product better, right? Yeah. Uh, you invest in customer success so more people are getting adoption, maniacally focus on that churn rate, uh, the customer dollar churn, 
and then you have to either have seed expansion or more products to sell or tier yes. expansion. Like otherwise the math just doesn't work. There's no. just no way to kind of get there from here. And, and, um, but did you feel like you were anything less than fully succeeding when you had that sort of suboptimal NRR? Did you feel literally the pressure kept us of it? up at night. You yeah. know, the whole time where we had high churn and you know sub 100 percent, we're like, and this is we're having a you know a pretty good run, but this yeah. is not going to be the thing. What we was the board to be. saying? Were they saying this is great? The 75 percent revenue? I'll, ta I'll tell you <laughs> no. something. I'll tell you something about the early funny days about the HubSpot. We had a wonderful woman on our board named Gail Gibman that was the CEO of a company called Constant Contact that you don't hear much about yeah. anymore. Yeah, well, Ben Chestnut talked a lot about yeah. it. The yeah, of course, day. but yeah. back in the day, they were yeah. high Big flyer. deal in the Salesforce ecosystem yes. for s and And their unit yeah. economics were, I can't remember, but you basically put a dollar in and you get $3 out. That was yeah. the LTV to CAC ratio. And ours were like one and 2.5s so were like, well, we were in spitting distance of a real public company. Little did we know that yeah. the economics of that business were gonna fall apart. And we didn't find that out actually until we did our round with Sequoia. And there's a, there's a par partner there named Pat Grady. And he really dug into the way we were measuring this. And we kept talking and bragging about constant contact. He's like, you're measuring against the wrong company. You need to start thinking about, and he started look, showing us benchmarks relative to companies like Google, like LinkedIn, and it's more like five to one, 10 to one, you need to get there. And we got quite serious about improving those numbers after, the, after, <laughs> after getting beat up by Pat Grady pretty good. Yeah, well, we'll talk about multi-product, but that's a good, that's, I think that's a fun learning for me how far you went before you improve that KPI, right? Forever, forever, forever. 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 Like, like it would be 12 years. Yes. And it was like, not from, from like lack of focus, it was just so hard, hard to move those numbers. Yeah. It was yeah. just forever. so hard. The, 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 there's one, HubSpot's lived many lives and we've gone through many transformations and pivots within HubSpot, but one of them was, HubSpot initially was obsessed with the relationship between our company and a prospect and converting that prospect to a customer. And we got really good at it. We kept our CAC low. We could really sell. Mark Roberge was our head of sales. Had him on stage many times. And at some point we just woke up and just like, started asking customers why they bought. And largely the reason they bought was word of mouth. And so we switched our focus to the relationship between a uh, HubSpot and a customer and turning that customer into a delighted customer with word of mouth. And you can see that change in our P&L. We started moving money from sales and marketing into product. We started hiring heavily in engineering and product and in design and got quite, quite serious about just we're in the customer delight business, not in the customer acquisition business. And uh, that was a massive shift for us. So it was sort of, we flipped it overnight on it. And when was that roughly? If you had, you can guess. Uh, if I had to guess, it's pre-IPO. So, <laughs> yeah. Now you think that's early. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well ago. Uh, yeah. yeah. I don't remember. About a year. 40, 50 million era or earlier? Or? Earlier than that, because it took us a while to get to 40 to 50. That was like a year before the IPO, I think, a year and a half is when we got to 50. Um, well, in any event, what's interesting is you decided word of mouth, you wanted to incent word of mouth. Yeah. yeah. And, and instead of putting that into other types of marketing or even customer success, you intentionally put it into product. Poured it into product. Poured it in, and, and But that's what you have to do, did right? You, so the product spend 50% or did you double product spend? We went, we did the exact opposite thing of what you're supposed to do. Yeah. And I think companies are a reflection of their CEOs and I'm, I'm CEO and I'm a sales guy and I'm very excited about sales and we had a hockey stick and want to keep that hockey stick going. And so we invested a lot early in sales and marketing and the product just wasn't there. And until it took about 10 years in before the product got really legit and we were proud of it. Um, whereas most CTO companies agree. really start, they don't hire the first salespeople yeah. for a while and they invest in R&D. We had our, our math was backwards. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I remember the meeting we had when we had that kind of epiphany that we need to shift from being like a sales marketing focused to kind of product and, and customer focused. And it was at a founder's dinner, which is usually multi hours involving multiple bottles of wine. Um, and we made the decision then at that dinner that's like, oh, you know, we can't just keep going down the path we're going. We're not going to achieve the ambition. We're not going to get to HubSpot to where we want it to be. We're both in agreement. Awesome. So let's decide we're going to be a product company. Awesome. We've decided we're going to be a product company. It's like the team's not going to believe us. Like, what, like how is that going to change behavior? And, uh, and so, and, and to Brian's credit, he's like, okay, well, the way to change behavior is to change the P&L that says we're not going to spend a dollar on sales and marketing hires until we can get the product to a certain level of subjective uh, quality, essentially. It was subjective. You didn't have a case. It was the two of us. Like, we knew it sort of, yeah, it wasn't and we great. we started obsessing over NPS. Yeah. Okay, that was your version. Yeah. Then we did an acquisition to kind of help to get the product and the team kind of revamped, uh, spent a yep. bunch on designers. Um, yep. But you thought it was ten. It's interesting. You thought it was ten years until Before the product, product was great. Got, we were really proud of it. Really proud of it. Yeah. 
Yeah. We also did these, another exact opposite thing of everyone tells you. Focus on a little tiny thing and get great at it and then spread. We focused on like a very <laughs> wide, it's like huge surface area. And we absolutely sucked at all of it. And then over time, we just got better and better and better and better. It took about 10 years before, okay. But your, what was the wedge in there? Besides the other stuff, what was the 10X feature? There wasn't, it was the all-in-one. It was the fact that we had- That at, was the 10X? Because yep. really, that, that's, that's rare, that an yep. all-in-one yep. really is So there was no killer feature. app. Everything that we had in our product existed. There were better yep. products with great companies behind them. The value that we brought was the fact that we made it simple for these SMBs yeah. to actually get into the internet, get in the game, because those products existed for a long time, but then 95% you know, of SMBs didn't have a website, weren't doing anything meaningful in terms of marketing and sales. Um, that was the thing we were on to. Yep. So to it call. sounds like you had, uh, like, you know, at the end, companies are either sales-led or sort of product-led at some level. Occasionally there's quirky other ones, marketing or design, like MailChimp or Figma, we chat about. But, did you argue? Did the CTO argue that there was not enough resources in engineering? Were you, were you frustrated with your co-founder? Uh, well, I don't call it frustration because we both made a deliberate decision in the early, um, early years of HubSpot that says, okay, we're building business software. Okay, we right. get it. We're not putting someone on Mars, inventing a new energy source. So let's stipulate that if we happen to stumble into an actual market, that we will be able to build the product to kind of serve that market. So the risk we were trying to mitigate in the early years is the only way to figure out if there's a market or not is to try and sell into that market and see if people will pay you money and if they will stay, right? Yes. So that's the thing. Um, and the, the challenge was, uh, so that was a very deliberate, intentional decision. But then you sort of get addicted to that curve, right? And going month and month and quarter, it's like, oh, that looks really pretty. It's really fun to show that at a board meeting. Um, so we didn't get frustrated with each other, but we, I think we had a, like a, a joint epiphany that says, okay, well, this can't continue. Like, it's been a good run, but we can't do this. There was no argument. It was like, yeah, let's do but, this. But the HubSpot has shifted completely from, it was a sales company for a long time, known around the Boston area as a sales company, known in San Francisco. It's a product company now, very much a product DNA. That's the center of gravity. That's the power center in the company. Totally shifted over the last. I think it's a harder, harder change than, uh, than we, I mean, it, and maybe in some ways it took 10 years, right? We went the opposite way. Every, well, we went the opposite way you should go. You probably went the opposite way of an SMB-focused company. I think many enterprise folks, yeah. the Mark Benioffs of the world, literally can walk in and sell, not in the beginning because it was SMB, ironically, but later sell, come in and say, for $20 million, I'll solve your problem, Brian. Yep. Like, and that, that's powerful, right? Yep, yep. But I don't know many SMBs that can brute force it through sales. It's a, it's a tough path, isn't that it? Is, let, let me tell you a story about Ben Chestnut. Okay. So I'm a giant Ben Gen Chestnut fan, and I, I, I went to visit him down in Atlanta one day, and we had an argument, and I'm not an argumentative fellow. And I said, we're in the SMB business, but we're more M than S. So we sell the startups and scale-ups. He said, you're full of shit, there's no M. M is like, that's the valley of death. There's S and there's enterprise. I'm not right about much, but I think I was right about this one. There's an M, and yes. a lot of you are in the software business and thinking about your persona and target market. There's a huge, huge market in the M, and the M, think of it like 10 employees to 2,000 employees. They have money, they have pain, the small business products don't solve it, the enterprise companies don't solve it, it's too expensive, too hard to put in, and so we want to build an anchor company in there, and there's lots of room for all of you to come into the water in that M. M is the, yeah. M is, uh, M is the new black. Yeah, by the way, most of you are likely <laughs> M's, right? You're mid-sized companies, you've kind of gotten through some of those early um, uh, early years, you've got some revenue coming in. You're real businesses. You're yep. selling real sustainable businesses. Um, and so there's a lot of you out there, a lot of, a lot of M's. I'm pro. I think the thing is that th there was always the VCism that M's the death, right? The ACV is yes. too low. Yep. The cost of sales is too high. Um, but the truth is most M's expand a little bit. They go a little bit into the E yep. or a little bit into the S, right? And I don't know where HubSpot is. It seems like there's, a, it, there's not, I don't, know how, do, I don't know if one person solo shops that are running on MailChimp are running HubSpot, I can tell HubSpot, you exactly right? what it is. What's that? You have three segments, two to 20. Two to 20. And what 20, percent's that? I might forget. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> 20 to 200. Yes. And then 200 to 2,000. Yes. And we grade ourselves. You know, what's our grade in each of those things? And... You know, the 20 to 200, I give us an A. The two to 20, I give us a B. The 200 to 2000, I give us a B. Okay. And we talk about internally, our focus is bimodal. So we're trying to improve our motion in our product for that 200 to 2000. And we're trying to improve our motion and the ease of use on the two to 20. Yes. So we're kind of focusing on both ends of that. Do you think, and I get that, right? But, and, and, and by the way, the two to 20 is interesting because 
We don't make a tremendous amount of money on two-person companies, but it's hard to become a 20-person company before you're a two-person company, like on your way to 20 yeah. or 200, you're two. And we won't have to rip and replace something out. We want you to start with HubSpot and grow with HubSpot. Yeah, let's talk about that second. Do, do, you, I, I, do you really think you can do both equally as well, though? I mean, I know you want to because we're passionate about it, yep. but the motions are so different. Like, the, the, just the features. Yep. The features from two to two, even though we love them all, our yep. children, can you really prioritize them equally? So, and this is a long-running uh, debate up until we made the decision, um, and even now, because it's another zig, right? Like, everyone you ever talk to says, you got to pick one. You're not going to be able to straddle the fence and do both you know, reasonably well. You're going to yep. compromise both. Um, and there are really good, strong arguments in that favor. The counter argument um, for us was, okay, well, we have a lot of leads coming in, that's, that's part of it, but it's like, oh, well, the, the investment we make on our upper market 200, 2000 segment, we have these features that we add that we can kind of subside, we're making money, yes. and then over time, our MO is we pull those down to lower tiers, all the way down to the free tier. And so it benefits, the fact that we're in the kind of upmarket market yes. benefits our lower end customers because they get access to a set of features over time um, that they wouldn't have gotten access to. It helps that we're in the kind of free and starter tier on the lower end because what happens is we are forced by constraint to make the product easy. Because if it were not easy, if for it were sure. purely upmarket, sure. yes. we wouldn't be able to support it. We yes. just so it has to, and so both modes kind of benefit each other. Um, it makes us relatively rare because very few people try to do it that way. Um, and yes, it is hard and we're constantly balancing when we have uh, what we think of as the HubSpot spotlight. It's like, okay, yeah, we're doing both. But in any given period of time, it's like, okay, we're really going to focus on the velocity on this market right now and try to fix that go-to-market motion. Okay, that's doing pretty well. Let's shift it. And let's now, for the next six, nine, 12 months, kind of focus on that upmarket, make that go-to-market better, make sure our product marketing is working. Uh, it, it's, it's not a perfect science, but it's worked for us so far. Do enough of, I should know this, but I don't, do enough of the two to 20 graduate to make the investment worth it on its own? Uh, or do they stay two to 20? Oh, there's a lot of movement between there's enough. them, a lot. Right. I know yeah. there's a lot of movement in the middle up, but yeah, not yeah. always from the bottom is there. Yeah, but even as a, as a, if it were a standalone business, yeah. it would still be a reasonable business. So we're not just doing yeah. it for lead gen for the up market. It's like, oh, the only reason we're doing all this free yep. starter stuff is because um, it feeds uh, the upper tiers. It's, it's a legitimate business on its own, just a different, different set of physics, um, but yeah. Well, it's funny, I was recently, I was, I was re sort of researching Zendesk where it is today because it's such a change, right? And all their motions in one million plus deals, yep. right? That's where all the growth is at, at their scale. But on, on our own, just for ourselves, I was researching help desks. What do they like today? Yep. And it's the only one of scale that still has a, 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 a small version. Yep. All the other ones, like and Drift, who came out of here, they're wonderful. Intercom, they, they don't have it. They don't have that starter edition. Yep. And Zendesk kept it, which is super interesting in a million, right? Yep. So it must work for them. Yep. But it's not easy, right? It's, it's not easy to keep it. I don't know if you've studied them as a comp for going multi-stage, yep. right? Totally. Um, but it's interesting. We did something interesting during COVID. COVID was like a massive shock to all of us. <laughs> the first week of COVID, we, have, we had a starter edition it was kind of expensive, and then we said, you could now buy, it was maybe 250, 300 bucks, I can't remember. But we said, we're gonna lower the price if you buy the whole suite, sales, marketing, service, content management system, ops, and you run your whole company on it, it's 50 bucks a month. And, but the supply and demand curve behaved in a different way than we thought, like but there was a massive influx of customers through that. And that's dramatically improved our business. The upsell rate's been really good on that. Uh, it's pretty low touch motion. That was actually a really oddly great thing that came out of COVID from us is that. Oh, so you, ran an, ex you ran, an, ran an experiment of lowering your price point at the yes, bottom of the market, starter, right? and, and it worked. worked the starter bundle, so the well. entire, so you know, we're trying to make a platform sale, don't just yeah. pick you know, pieces of the HubSpot uh, platform, and that worked. Yeah. Worked incredibly well. Was that, was that in that window where we thought the economy would collapse, and yes. everyone, needed yes. A, yes. everyone needed economic yes. relief yeah. for about four and a half weeks? Yes, yes. exactly. Yeah, yeah. Everyone yeah. ran something, or right? W or a swoosh, <laughs> or a, Yes. All right, that deserves its own own analysis and blog <laughs> yeah, post of how that experiment, we how that experiment worked. Yeah. So, all right, I want to talk some more. We might jump around, but I, I don't want to, since I have you together, I want to talk a little bit about the relationship, so I don't want to let it go. Um, what was like your toughest time as co-founders? It's going to sound cliche to say it. We haven't really had None? any like tough, like you super tough times. Never had a terrible, art, never wanted to pull each other's hair out? Or every week? Uh, no, zero or one, rarely. Right? So, rarely? And I think part of it, and this is what I'm, one thing I would advise for those uh, that are kind of earlier stage, uh, one thing we did that I think helped a lot 
is like the week before we actually officially founded the company, we went through this kind of series of really hard questions that we kind of asked each other. It's like, okay, so what do we want out of this? What if next year someone comes offering 50 million, 100 million dollars to acquire the company? What do we do? What if one of us becomes disenchanted with the company, just doesn't really, is not that excited? What if one of us is just not putting in the hours because they've got, you know, they have to make side income for whatever reason? Like, so all those hard questions, we kind of talk through up front, right? And so one of the big decisions was around, like the reason we're starting HubSpot is like we both had a, a bit of a chip on our shoulders. Like we've had singles and doubles. We've done some good things in our lives, but like this is our last and this is our last time up I at see. that. And so it's a bunch of things flow from that, right? So a, a thousand arguments that could have been had about should we raise capital, should we do this, they weren't even discussions we had to have because we've already decided that we're swinging for the fences. And anytime there's a fork in the road, we're going to go for the more ambitious, higher beta. Um, People so that, don't do that, that enough. They don't do that enough, right? And you were aligned on all those points, including we, the yeah. 50 oh, million dollars. Well, otherwise, we wouldn't have started the company yeah, if we had not been really aligned wrong. on those things. Yeah. So it's like it's yeah, life is short. Similar points in our career. Yeah, philosophically well aligned. We both liked SMB. Uh, we were at the time Web 2.0 was a huge thing, and we yeah. wanted to do something Web 2.0. Uh, you we should both you should tell them about uh, our decision making heuristic. The Okay, yeah. First of all, you want to know how I met Dharmesh? <laughs> okay. So we both went to business school together, and it was the night before class started. And uh, there's an event at the uh, Marriott Hotel in Kendall Square in, in Cambridge. And uh, I was on my second Sam Adams, as one would do. <laughs> and a beautiful woman walked up to me, and she starts asking me a lot of questions, like kind of like, rapid fire almost inter like not a dialogue more q and a and i thought man these sloan people are strange <laughs> and she very quickly abandoned me and i came to find out later darmesh's strategy at a cocktail party he's a little introverted is he 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 goes in the corner and he stands behind the tree and he sends his wife out to interview people <laughs> that was the That's a good spouse. The interview. That's a great spouse. Here's the scout. You want the scouting report? Yeah. You'll never like him. <laughs> oh, the sales guy? The sales guy over there, you won't like him? You'll never like him. That guy, don't even bother. He likes the Red Sox, sales guy. Don't even, we didn't meet. She, she's That's like, we didn't even meet. <laughs> the only time in 30 years she's been wrong on a scouting report, for the record. Uh, uh, I That's forgot. a gift, Armesh. What's that? That's a gift to have a scout. We it all, is. It really I highly is. recommend it, by the way. Yeah. Yeah, I think so that awesome. counts as meeting or that doesn't count as meeting? I guess we didn't meet. So no, it doesn't count. Yeah. <laughs> cool. I forgot what your question was. Oh, uh, <laughs> well, no, actually, I, I learned a lot from it. I, like, I wrote this post years ago, not, not talking about me, about a founder commitment test, where yeah. I said, have, and, and I said, my forcing function for the test is do eight year vesting. Yeah. With no cliff. And, and, and the hard discussion has to happen if you yeah. say, I don't care if it took us two years to get here, starting day we're going to have a cliff in a year. So if yeah. either of us quit, yep. we leave with nothing, yep. and then eight years after that. And I said, if you do this, it will force you to talk about exit, what if we get tired, because the one that doesn't want to go long, which is not a bad thing, will not First sign up for the, <laughs> the one I think plus eight test. They'll, they'll walk out we the didn't door. Do if it, I had thought of it back then, yeah, probably we would have done, done like the eight, ten year vesting. Yeah, that was, that was that's a really good idea. A consideration yeah. or it, it all. screens it out. We don't do it. But, yep. but it's interesting to me that you guys got a lot. You did this test for yep. real. I never heard yep. of anyone that did it. Yep. Now, one of the and things, it works. One of the things, stayed together, right? One of the things that really worked, and it was Darmesh's idea, was he said we need to figure out how to make decisions and disagree. Because you're going to disagree. And so the way it works is actually quite simple. If we both agree on a given topic, of course we do it. If one of us feels really strongly and is willing to lay on the tracks on a topic and the other person's like, eh, I kind of disagree with you, but you feel strongly, we go with the lay on the track person. If we both are strong on it and the opposite ends of an argument and both of us relying on the tracks we argue we argue we argue we argue we argue but i get to break that tie how many times do you think i've broken that tie like, i'm gonna bet one like one or two like never uh, ne never? never yeah it's so rare yeah and the, the i think one of the important points on that heuristic is that it's not the person whose kind of area it falls under. So if, even if it were a product thing or a tech thing or whatever, if Brian feels strongly and I don't, yes. um, he still wins. And if, if it's a sales related business thing, even sales comp or whatever, marketing, whatever it is, even though that's not my kind of area of expertise, and I feel strongly and he doesn't, 
then my way goes, right? So it's less about kind of jurisdiction and who owns what, and it's more about who feels more strongly. Do you, a niche question, the first one, and then I want to go on with this. This idea of a front person, which we don't talk a lot about in SaaS or business software, but who is the public face of the company? And it's got to be the CEO at some level, right? But I think one interesting thing about HubSpot is how well known and beloved, I'm just being objective, don't take it as a compliment. Um, well known and <laughs> beloved, uh, Darmesh has become, totally. I think for a long time, yes, right? For a long totally. time, not just Twitter followers, but, but putting in the, yeah. the reps and the work to, to give back. Did you guys think about that? As an asset to manage it, did you talk about? Did you talk about who would cover what surface area? Like who would, who would or is it just all organic? Just kind of did all it. Organic, just yeah. kind of did it. Yeah. The beauty Dar of social media is it's built for antisocial people like me, right? <laughs> a it's little like, bit, uh, yeah, a little, a little <laughs> bit, right? If it works, it really helps, right? The one thing we did early on is we create a lot of content, like you, and back then we wrote blog articles, and we each write two blog articles a week and we'd try to see how many leads we could get per blog article. So we had this kind of friendly competition uh, where we're rooting for each other because we want a lot of leads, but we wanted to see who could get more. And back then, the way to get a lot of leads, get on the front page of Dig. Of <laughs> Dig. Or Reddit. Oh, Dig. Or, yeah. Oh, now we're Remember dating ourselves. Dig? I forgot, about, I forgot <laughs> Dig even existed. Reddit, yes. yeah, yeah. Uh, so who was better? At, Darmesh could hack it, or? We were both pretty good. I think Darmesh we was better at it. Good. I think yeah. we were roughly equally matched. Yeah, I think Darmesh was pretty good. The content like was probably different, well, right? The content was probably different. Yeah. But uh, we didn't, we've never talked about who's the front man. I don't feel like we have one front person. Yes. And now we have a new CEO, and so we have a third person involved. Yeah. So actually, it's interesting that the, in the early days, we know a bit about HubSpot and SEO and website grading and content, but blog posting, to be very specific, it worked for you to really get I mean, I know about all the stuff, but the two of you in the early days, right, each of you writing blog posts yes. multiple a times a week got yes. the company off the ground. Yes. Yes. How, many, right? how many visitors to our blog do you think we get a month? I know it's, I know it's many millions now, right? It's 10 million a month. 10 million a month. Yeah. Just the blog. You know, 30 million across all the web properties that we have. The SEO is like crazy, itself. isn't it? it right. I still don't understand it, but, here, but it works. Here's the weird thing. The, <laughs> the beauty of blogging and content in general is yes. it's kind of accretive and accumulative over time. So there are articles I have written 15 and a half years ago, back in yes. the first year of HubSpot. It's still on the internet, still, still drives leads, right? It gets visitors, gets leads that I wrote 15 years ago, right? That was a one-time investment. Um, yeah, it, the it new, works. The new one is our podcast. That's 9 million downloads a month. Yeah. That's worked really well. Really that uh, it, it's like there's, it works for for and for for advertising or for folks that want to get customers. People listen to this stuff. Yeah. yeah. Right. I yeah. mean, it's they, they people don't get it because you don't get the same analytics, right? No. You can't get it. But my God, to get nine million per, even even ten thousand people in your industry to listen to your pitch, totally. like it's it's a people don't know it. It's a yeah. gift, right? Yeah. It's a gift. The other value that outside of just kind of in terms of content creation, uh, yeah. blogging as well, but um, is that. It forces you to think about your business, like or whatever position or point of view you have about your industry. You ha you have to write it down twice a week, and you get the internet's really great at telling you you're an idiot about whatever, right? It's uh, and so that's a great way to kind of litmus test um, or pressure test your ideas yes. as you're moving in. So like when we were writing about inbound marketing, it was new, and like that way we made the thing up, um, and it was nice to kind of get the the feedback from the industry. Like, oh, people are nodding their heads; they're agreeing with this stuff as we get on stages or um, you know through online blogs. I'll tell you one thing about Darmesh that people don't know. Okay, that'd be good. I didn't have like the embarrassing question here, but it would be fun to, uh, to, to get that one. What do we not know? This isn't embarrassing, well, it's not really embarrassing. Um, Darmesh is one of those people, and I think he's right about this, that he leans into his strengths and he completely ignores his weaknesses. And if he puts his mind on a strength, he gets really, really good at it. In the early days of HubSpot, he put his mind to SEO, became one of the foremost, foremost experts in SEO. Um, these days he's put his mind into like, we have this conference inbound, it's kind of like this. Uh, we just had it last week. I think he's the best public speaker, like keynote speaker in all of tech. Like he has nailed it. He's our top playing. five all time. So yeah, he's amazing. Yeah. Um, and he's really good. But if it, it's not in his wheelhouse or he's not interested in doing it and you ask him to do it, like, Darmesh, can you pick this, this, this chair up or this pillow? Darmesh, would you mind picking this pillow up? This is, this, oh, this is too hard, I can't. That's a damn thing. I just can't, I can't do it, I can't do it. He's, but if he wants to do it, he can pick this whole building up over his head. Uh. <laughs> 
I'm a big believer in that idea, by the way, is uh, don't spend as many calories mitigating your weaknesses. Focus on the things you're very good at and get great at them. That's where you kind of stand out and kind of rise above the noise. It's, uh, yeah. It's worked really well for you. All right, I want to hit this, but I know it's a bit of a non sequitur, but you talked about inbound was last week. Yep. Um, it was great. Thank you. You, had, you. you spoke to Obama, is that right? I, I seen interviewed it yet. Obama. You interviewed. What's, you said you had a secret story to tell us. Okay. I, have, I, need to, I, I, I want to know. Have you guys did. heard of about Barack Obama? Okay. <laughs> we, we do have a pretty diverse international crowd yeah, here. There's I a I small chance. But. Okay, so one of the things about it was is, he a tough get or were these days how busy is he these days before we even get to it he's hanging around martha's vineyard, hanging around martha's vineyard. <laughs> he's got time i don't know i don't know doing a little angel investing with william and uh or yeah. whatever in, anyway uh, the, the, so i got to interview him which was yeah. a, it was a real honor for me to interview him and i was very excited about it. super nervous by the way <laughs> and uh he's a very thoughtful very smart guy and that was very apparent during his speech but just when we were backstage here jason darmesh and i and there wasn't like a lot of coordination, but there's a lot of coordination in inbound. And there's a stage manager that describes where you go on the stage and sort of organizes it and makes sure the video goes on time, you sit in the right seat, the copy's there and all this stuff. And they're, at our conference, they're OCD about it. So uh, President Obama and I are backstage and the, woman, the woman's there, she's very nice. And she says, okay, President Obama, Brian's gonna go out first. He's gonna sit on the seat in the right and you're gonna sit in the seat in the left. And when the, the event is over, Brian's going to leave uh, on the right, and you're just going to follow him off. And Obama's like, oh, wait, wait a second. So do I, I go, no, no, Brian goes first. He's like, do I sit in the seat on the left? No, no, you're in the seat in the right, and Brian's in the seat in the left. So I, I got it. And so I'm talking to Obama about basketball or something. He's like, wait, 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 wait. Am I on the left? I'm on the seat in the left. <laughs> He's on the right. She's like, no, 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 no. You just follow Brian. It's going to be fun. He's like, okay. <laughs> it was like a Seinfeld episode back there. With I, he might have he been playing with you a little bit. He wasn't. He wasn't. He wasn't seen the one on, per, on, uh, he was, on uh, he was beans not. and cars with coffee. I have. He was not playing with no. me. No. And then so we do the whole thing. And it's very simple when it's over. He gets a giant standing ovation, which was lovely. And it's very simple. He's supposed to follow me off to the right. And he's, and he's like lost. He's like, <laughs> <laughs> he's one of the smartest guys I've ever met. And he was just and by the way, we have secret service there, right? This is Barack Obama. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> perplexed about the seating arrangement. <laughs> In all fairness to the former president, that's why we actually don't do that anymore. We used to do it. We used uh -huh. to tell people Confusing, what order to go apparently. in, and it was too stressful. <laughs> Darmesh, you're you're on the chair on the right, yeah. right? And now we just like this guy, like this is disaster. Yeah. Okay, like yeah. it's it's going to be great. We're founders. Loser. We know what we Loser. can figure out how to sit in a chair. You should have Obama next year. He'll love it. Yeah. Okay, we can try. <laughs> <laughs> I, so I get it, but <laughs> we've learned. Um, okay, we're having a lot of fun, so I don't want to get, get too serious, but crazy stuff changed it and and you won't remember but you were so kind you did like dur during peak lockdown you did a, a, a our podcast or something we did a video and it was great and we talked about the partner channel and this stuff and i asked you how i was going and you had like your lumberjack shirt on and you're like it's great and i i'm, I'm kind of like i don't want to do this forever but man it's pretty good to get a break after all these years i'm going snowmobiling and it, maybe it was just maybe it was oh, I forgot it was that. a month but i felt like it was 3 days later my I jaw forgot. my jaw my jaw drops oh i forgot my my jaw my jaw drops and there's like this this accident yep. and um, i don't know somehow i know it's not, I, I just knew it was rough right just maybe it was the way the communications was right because it was sparse you know when you get that sparse you know it's not good when it's sparse right it's it's uh, when it's minor it's <laughs> it's already done so they give you all the details so um, how did you get over this? What, what are the learnings? And like, and to me, I feel like a black swan event happens every once in a while, doesn't it? And then the, you do this for 20, been, how, long, how old subspot? 16, 16 years? 16, yep. yep. There's gonna be like a couple of them, aren't there? I guess. Is I this hope, the only I black swan? I hope this swan? is the last one of these for me. Yeah, <laughs> last one. Uh, I, crazy. It was crazy. I remember, I don't remember talking to you from Vermont. I can just tell you the story. I was snowmobiling. Yeah and missed the turn and went off a small, I would just call it a small cliff and was going very, very fast, going through the air, smashed into a tree and then smashed into the ground. Yeah. And I'm there on the side of a mountain, it's 4.30 in the afternoon, it's getting dark, it's freezing, no one knew where I was. And I was pretty sure I was gonna die that day on the side of the mountain. Um, you were alone for hours and hours in the dark? I was alone there for a while and 
I remembered about a half hour in that I had my iPhone, and I never bring my iPhone because in Vermont there's no signal anywhere in Vermont. Yeah. And so I pull the iPhone out, I had just enough, and I called these three num numbers I had never dialed in a row, 911. Um, that's the killer app, by the way. You want to know the killer app? 911 is the killer app. And the woman was lovely. And then she called the local fire state. There's two local fire stations. They're all volunteer. Yeah. So they're all at home. And then they call them at home. And they get their snowmobiles. And they come find me. And it's dark. And they like patch me up. And they drag me out. And then they helicopter me to Dartmouth University Hospital and save my life. But it was, it was actually just sitting in the snowbank where I was like, I love my job been a great 15 years, but Yamini, who works for me, who she's fantastic, is probably better suited to be CEO, it's getting a little tired. You know, when this is over, she's going to take That was over. in your mind in the helicopter, in the evacuation? Free helicopter. That, that it was her time? Yeah, it's like, if, I, if I'm going to live through this, yeah. what do I want my life to look like on the other side? And I want to work in things that can have as big an impact as possible. So, you know, to be you know, I'll let people know later what I'm going to do next, but I got big plans for my next chapter. Ah, and where were you at? Darmesh, when you heard this news, is it just crazy? I was or at what? home and it was crazy when I heard it. Crazy. Uh, and like, you know, life lesson for me is don't get on snowmobiles. Um, yeah. That's, um, but yeah. I'm pretty, it, sure, it's just, pretty, pretty sure that was gonna happen right, anyway. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, it's the whole movement thing. The right reason now. it was sparse was I just, no one knew, it was COVID, so no one could like visit me, I couldn't talk oh, on the yeah. phone, uh. no one came in the hospital. And so no one knew how bad it was. It was way worse than I think people thought. Uh, uh, I knew. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so Yamini was obviously, I mean, I forget, she's been here many times. She was CCO at Dropbox before you hired her and somewhere really great before that, work, right? Work day. Was she a potential CEO candidate already in the back of your mind or not? Uh, and did she know she was a CEO candidate? No. She did not know you, you, were, you were doing your job as founders, right? Well, a couple weeks before the accident, we had a board meeting and we had that Okay, Brian gets hit by a bus was the term. Who takes over? Yeah, you got to yeah. have that conversation. So right? we, you do, and we said, well, yeah, well, Darmesh and I were both like, we think Yamini should take over. And the board was like, yes, great. And then I get hit by a bus, but I get run over, <laughs> you know, hit by a tree. Uh, and so break glass, Yamini took over. And then she did a fabulous job while I was healing. And then when I was done healing, I said, you know, I'm not coming back. Would like you to be. You uh, own it. I'd like you to be CEO. I don't want to do it. Um, I, she was like, I'll be COO, or you would do co-CEO, I don't want to do it. I was like, you get two choices, I can go find some schmuck from the outside, or you're doing it. Uh, <laughs> she thought about it for a while, she's like, all right, I'll do it. And she's been awesome. She's been awesome. She's been yeah, awesome. clearly been awesome. She's a great right? CEO. Really so as executive chair now, what does that mean for your work week? Like, are you still, you're 100% on HubSpot, but more working on the future and vision, or how does that, how does that fit today? It comes and goes. Like, we had in, inbound last week, uh, yeah. busy uh, getting confused with Barack Obama. Um, <laughs> and we had a board meeting this week, super yeah. busy. We're at Saster, so fired up to be here with my hero, Jason Lemkin. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, comes and goes, busier some weeks than others. What did she, um, uh, it, 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 I mean, it, the company has clearly thrived under Yamini, right? And we could almost do a whole set, I mean, she's not here, she's been here before, but it's, what are a couple of things that she did better when she took the reins? Like, what did she level up with her experience? Because she had a lot of experience you guys don't have, right? Yep. It was sort of before she took over that she did some, when, that, when COVID hit, she, she had just joined HubSpot, by the way, and then bam, COVID hit. Oh, yeah. And she kind of took the reins, and she was the one that made the decision on that pricing, dropping that starter suite down, that, which turned out to be a brilliant decision. She had the DNA, too, right? From, from yeah. Dropbox a little bit, maybe? And the other thing she decided was we have, we got about half our business through partners, and she said these partners are going to really be sucking wind. They're going to have to lay everybody off. Let's advance them their commissions for a year and to oh. give them some leeway, which turned out to be brilliant. They didn't lay anyone off. We bought so much goodwill with our partners. They love you. That. They love yeah. us. They yeah. love you. And then yeah. after that, like the, the social issues sort of rocked the country. And, that's, and that was brought inside the walls of every company. And she was just a great sounding board through all that stuff. And the election stuff that happened and then the accident, how well she handled that. She's very good in a crisis, very calm, very professional. And she's whip smart and a really good leader. Um, I'm a big fan of female leaders like half of HubSpot's leadership team, more than half are female, and more than half of the uh, board is females, and she's got it. She's really, really good. When do you think she, I mean, it's a parallel universe, when do you think she would have been CEO if it weren't for this craziness? But two more years out or something? How Probably a year. Traditional process? Yeah, yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. yeah. 
Crazy. Well, I'm glad you're back. Me too. It was just, <laughs> I mean, I've never, never asked before, but I mean, when I saw it, I just, oh man, it just, it, it, it just hurt, right? I mean, it, uh, oh, goodness gracious. So I think we hit this. I know we've got a couple minutes. I want to hit, I want to just maybe just hit a couple things. Um, maybe some tactical stuff about HubSpot that's interesting for the audience. Um, this slide, so I pulled, I, uh, last year Aaron Levy came and I pulled some slides from his analyst day, like right after he's like, oh, Jason, I got to do it again. <laughs> so, for, so forgive me, you guys said it was all right, but if you really want to learn about a great company, a set, not every public company shares much, but HubSpot's great. And I shared some on Sastra, you'll see more, but you can really learn about this business. The analyst day was last week, right? The, and I, yeah. we won't have time to go over it. Anyone that's even has an ACV or, or motion like them, go read this, because it, yeah. it's a gift. So I, but I want to hit maybe one or two, but this one is so interesting, but I don't know what it means, but it's so interesting. 11% market growth, so this is the overall surface area of your customers, 35% revenue, so this means you're gaining share, right? Yes. And so what's, what, how did you triple your share? Well, I mean, I guess not literally triple, yeah. but what, what, what do I, how, how at scale are you continuing to take share? What does this mean? So part of it is focusing on like customer account, or as some might say, you know, number of logos. What, ha what is happening if you were trying to write market share as a function? Yes. The thing that makes market share easier to grow is your market share. So as your market share grows, more people are out there that can talk about you, and it's easier to expand market share than uh, you know, starting from a dead stop, which is not counterintuitive at all, right? That's intuitive. Uh, but this is the other thing where you know, market share, as we measure it, is, is around the TAM and how much we have, but then the number of customers. Um, having that starter tier and being in that bimodal business once again, so we can add 5,000, 6,000, 7,000 customers a quarter, right? Which we would never be able to do if we were purely kind of upmarket. Um, and although we like to measure revenue and that's how you know, analysts measure revenue, the reality is word of mouth is not a function of how much revenue you're making from a customer. Word of mouth is based on how many people love your product that are out there in the world. And it's much easier to do that and get that mind share. Uh, versus, and so lots of companies focus on like share of wallets. Oh, this company makes, and especially an enterprise, like, oh, here's their budget. We want to get as much of that budget as we possibly can. And we like to upsell and things like that too, but we are also very, very focused on just expanding that pool of customers uh, for a couple of reasons. One is it's worked out for us, but um, every customer you add, you're, and I think we miscalculate LTV, uh, most businesses do, because- it's Complicated. The, it's, it is complicated, but the one thing we miss is that LTV as it's currently measured is based on our current churn rate and current market dynamics, here's what a customer is worth that we sold right now. But if you've been out for a little while and you're like, oh, maybe we might add another product and here's where the trend line is, what's the actual lifetime value, right? So if it's like, okay, if we're trying to project that the customer's gonna be here for seven, 10 years, well, which they will, they're not gonna pay exactly the same price they're doing, right? That's not the trend. We know that it's more than that, right? Something, and anyway, so growing mind share and market share counts. It helps um, on the word of mouth, especially in, in this day and age, if you're trying to rise above the noise. It's, uh, we're big believers in word of mouth. Market share and mind share helps. That's the, gotcha. it's just deliberate investment. Um, let me just hit one or two and then we'll break. Um, I'll tell you, I think the secret sauce is. Yeah, see, what's the secret sauce? We we built our last point. We, bu we, we built our marketing app. We had, let's say, a workflow engine in there. We had reporting in there. And then we decided we were going to build a CRM suite, sales, yeah. da, 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 da. We started building the sales app. We built, started building our own workflow engine, our own reporting, everything. And then one day we woke up, it's like, why don't we put those all down below the stack and have a set of, we call them primary colors that we can paint from, data, uh, reporting, uh, workflows, is a handful of these. And then each application, we take these pieces and we paint the application because they share these things. That makes the application just fit together so nicely, so much easier to use, so much easier to unwrap. And it's just unique relative to the landscape of these cobbled together monstrosities yeah. that the competitors sell. That's the secret. Maybe one last question just on this. I would love to talk about more about the suite and all the features. Well, maybe we'll do it on the next time. Did you, I see HubSpot today as being the dominant SMB CRM, okay? And, but I didn't think it would happen not because I didn't think it could be built, but it's a different, it's a slightly different persona. It is adjacent. There were good app, I mean, Darmesh and, and I actually, he may not remember, we met it the first time when they were thinking CRM and I'd invested in a company that was doing a lot of it. And it's okay that the market's credit, but I thought the different persona and it would make it, that it would be successful, but I didn't think it would be dominant eight years later the way it is, right? And did you know, did you know you could win in a different buyer? Were you convinced you could? Or did it creep up on you as the years went on? 
it, it was well. We I'll hope, start. Yeah. We hope. We, we hope. hope. Yeah, yeah, we hope. Hope. Right. But I mean, this goes to when you're trying to decide whether you add a second product and you go from n equals yes. one to n equals uh, two plus. Um, you sort of have to know why you're doing it. There's a couple of reasons you do it, right? One is it's a natural adjacency. It's a fit. Uh, you know, the market expects us to do this over time. Uh, it could be defensive. That's like if we don't do this. We're not going to own. So that's partly ours was both offensive and defensive. Like, oh, we're in the marketing software business. If we don't have a CRM, long over the long fullness of time, uh, this is going to be a problem. Boxed in. And so this yes. is as you're Word. experimenting with new product ideas. Uh, one lesson we've learned is that there are things that you do as experiments, uh, but most experiments become self-fulfilling prophecies. You're trying stuff out, may or may not work. Um, but there, the opposite of that is if you decide, like we decided we were going to do CRM. It was not an experiment. We're like, I don't care if it takes us three years or five years or seven years or eternity. Yes. We're going to make this work. And so that, like, uh, then the universe kind of lines in your interest. Like, all this, the best people in the company want to go work on that project because they know it's a, an important thing that we're trying to get done. Um, and you kind of try to line everything you've got behind that one thing that you know you have to do. Um, and, and that helped. And of course, it might not have worked. Um, yes, it was a different persona, but. Uh, but did you know it would perform this well, CRM? We, 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 it's, it worked out exactly the way we drew it on the whiteboard, which rarely happens. <laughs> <laughs> rarely happens. But in a way, hey, by the way, it worked CRM out was, exactly the way we had hoped. It's a little bit easier than marketing software. And we feel like was. we're really early. Like our market share is like four yeah. percent. It's so early. Yeah, in the Gartner or whatever yeah. world, but I think it's pretty darn good in your core buyer, it right? Is. And, it is. and it's just interesting to me because. Uh, the last couple of years with SaaS, we've talked so much about folks that have like a multi-product, right? Mm -hmm. And the number one learning from everybody is the easiest path is when it's the same buyer, right? The yeah. same use case. And, yes. and, and I don't think it's exactly, it's adjacent, it's, it's your buddy, That's it's your pal, buyer. but it's not, and so it's, it's a non-intuitive, no. I don't think it's obvious that it would work, right? Yeah, it's not, not obvious. It's so. a different buyer. All right, yep. All right let's, thank, let's thank Brian and Darmesh, this was thank great. You. Thank, thank you very guys. much. Thank you. I'm going to follow Brian. Okay. See, see?